um, about the BIOS initiative, biological innovation for open society, biological open source, and the componentry that gives rise to this movement that we're um, fomenting uh, in some circles successfully. In other circles, it's still a cryptic uh, story that we hope to get past that. Uh, I'm going to be introducing who I am and what I, you know, my history to put a, a bit of a context to this. Uh, to make sure that you're all at the, at the right talk, you, you, this is the tech talk, right? And, and, and you know that this is not about, I saw that one of the titles was just building a LAMP stack, it was called. So I, you, I hope it's not, you're not thinking it's going to be about computation and, and software engineering. It's OK. The metaphor I'm going to be using for this little presentation is the building a LAMP stack for the life sciences, not with the intention of actually explicitly building a series of software tools, but rather using the metaphor of the power of having an available toolkit to do dramatically different things and to imagine yourself in a, in a thought world, uh, in a science fiction nightmare, in which no programming languages, no operating systems, no standards were actually made publicly available at any point during the evolution of the IT industry. It's almost unthinkable. Imagine uh, life with no um, common and powerful programming languages, with no standards to work towards, and with no fundamental operating systems with uh, characteristics you can uh, work towards. That is exactly the situation we're finding ourselves in the life sciences. And more pronounced than that is that those who do understand any aspect of the programming or the standards, in, by metaphor again, have now protected these with patents. Uh, so what we now have is a situation where in the life sciences, in biological innovation, as I call it, not just life sciences in academic laboratories, but real biological innovation that can happen in a farmer's field, it can happen in a clinician's office, it can happen in a public health worker's uh, outstation in Kampala, this is true biological innovation, not just biotech that happens at Stanford or Berkeley. In those circumstances, those individuals have the potential, the latency, to be able to create substantial innovation and create a lot of wealth in their communities. The problem is that the tools of fundamental science are not available to them, and the tools of the scientific method are so siloed that it is a great disservice to them to not use their creativity. So what I'll be talking to you about is in a sense, a huge opportunity at the same time as talking about a huge problem in the, life, in the life sciences or biological innovation. Part of my discussion will be about patents, but only a part of it. Part of it will be about biotech, but only a part of it. What I'd like you to do, since there are only six of you here from Google, what I'd really like you to do is try to think very, very far outside the box and imagine a very, very different world in which um, the four billion people who would not be able to afford this, if I were to buy this at Pete's Coffee as I did this morning, one just like this, it cost $4. There's four billion people whose entire income, not disposable income, but entire income per day is less than that $4. In fact, I looked very hard at Walgreens to buy a little prop that would cost less than a dollar that you'd recognize, and I couldn't find a thing. But there's over a billion people who make less than that in their total income, less than the price of three quarters of a Snicker bar, it turns out, uh, in their entire for an entire day, not disposable income, but in total income. But there's nothing wrong with these people except that they're poor. They're smart, they're creative, they're committed, they're poor. So we can think of those as an enormous resource. So when I'm going to be talking about biological innovation or biological open source, what I'm trying to think about is how can we tap into the enormous creative latent resource that's out there uh, in the world to deal with some fundamental problems. The most fundamental problem is if 4 billion people can, do not have any income to buy a latte. There is something so fundamentally uh, incorrect about the world that we can view that as a, a grand challenge, a true grand challenge. Now, the typical response to, to poverty and to serious problems within uh, the developing world, or for that matter, within the inequities in our industrialized world, is to fix the problem. So if there are problems of, of health, the idea is, at best, in philanthropy or governmental circles, well, let's develop a pharmaceutical or a vaccine for that problem. If the problem is food security, well, let's build a better yielding crop variety. That's actually a very linear response. It's not a catalytic response, and it doesn't in any way leverage the enormous creativity of the people experiencing the problem. That is what we wish to get beyond. In development circles, if you look at some of the great philanthropic foundations, the Rockefeller Foundation, which has been supporting us for 15 years, the Gates Foundation, which has been denying us for many years, um, their basic approach to philanthropy is identify a problem, identify partners who will solve that problem on behalf of poor people. And that's the great failing. It's on behalf of poor people, rendering them no longer creative members of the problem-solving equation. So what I'm going to talk to you about is a latent revolution that is extraordinarily exciting to us because it is uniquely possible at this point in time where communications, informatics, the life sciences themselves, and indeed the social fabric have co-evolved to the point where this is possible. Okay? So first, let me introduce myself since there's 
no one here to do so who knows me better than me, um, though Marie may say otherwise. <laughs> uh, uh, I, um, I was actually born not far from here. Um, as you can hear from my accent, I'm not Australian. Well, at least I'm not uh, born in Australia. I am now an Australian citizen, and our institute, Cambia, um, was formed about 15 years ago with the concepts formed about, about 20 years ago uh, as my response to what I perceived as both an injustice and an opportunity at once. The, my own background is as a molecular biologist. I did my PhD at University of Colorado in Boulder. I did my undergraduate in the labs, one of the labs that invented recombinant DNA here at University of California. And uh, during that time, I became fascinated by, obsessed by, methodology to discover that if you really wanted to change the world, it's not discovery-based science that will do it. It's inventing a method that empowers many others to do discovery-based or invention-based science. So methodology or tools are a very, very powerful and seductive engine for social change. I discovered that even as an 18-year-old working in recombinant DNA, a new method would come along. Within a matter of weeks or months, everyone would be using that method to do whatever that method made available, which in turn spawned new methodology itself. So. My assertion, even before I developed a sensible social conscience or an awareness of the world outside of the middle class white guy, was in fact that if you wish to change something, providing a methodology that fits the hand of a potential user is the single most powerful and cost effective way to do so. When I did my PhD, it was on a, a small worm of all things called Cenorhabditis elegans, a little nematode. It's only a millimeter long. And the reason I worked on that was because people knew every single cell from the time it was a single zygote, a single fertilized egg cell, up to the point it hatched. Our labs and others in Cambridge, England, and a few others in Washington University in St. Louis walked, worked out the lineage of that to follow what every cell became. So this cell at one time was a progenitor, now became a muscle and a nerve cell, and so on and so forth, with the idea that if we could understand the nature of these cell divisions and how decisions were made, we'd understand the worm. And that was, that was a, a grand ambition. My interest wasn't so much understanding the worm, but to figure out how to understand it. I was very interested in developing a method that would allow us to know the instant a cell was different than what it used to be. So in those days, I was trying to develop methods for doing what we call heuristics, for actually illuminating in, uh, information that has been previously cryptic. And this is where, in this entire talk, I think you can hearken to the, the mission of Google in developing and portraying for the world the information that is out there and asking, is there information that is currently latent or cryptic in the system that is of enormous value? Can we relay much, much more information than simply that which is digitized, but actually relay information that is intrinsic to the natural world in a format and at a time by which human beings can make judgments on that that are to the social and economic advantage? Okay, So this is when the, in a sense, part of my introduction of myself is relevant to Cambia. After I left Boulder, I went to the Plant Breeding Institute in Cambridge at the dawn of what would be considered plant genetic engineering. This was in the early mid-80s. And I worked with a team that did, ended up doing the first field release of a genetically engineered crop. And in fact, I invented the tool that became the mainstay for plant genetic engineering. And every company ranging from Monsanto to Ma and Pa Plant Breeders now uses that tool. And in the course of developing that, I also became aware of something else, that how you shape the tool depends very much on which hands can use it. And so we set out at that time, myself and all of my colleagues, my uh, immediate uh, grad student and postdoctoral colleagues working with me on that project were from what are sadly called developing countries. These were scientists from, uh, from Africa, from China, from India, from Poland, from Mexico, who knew that at this point in their career back in the 80s, it was getting a publication in a major journal that would give them a career development opportunity. But they also knew that if they went back to their home countries, the likelihood that they could have an impact on economies, social justice, decency, yields in crops, was very, very modest with the toolkit that was available at that time. It's very uh, cumbersome, it was very reductionist, um, and fairly ineffective. So what I saw here was an enormous opportunity. These were committed, smart people. They were dedicated to something that I knew, I, I knew very little about, meaning their, their home countries, agriculture, and economies. Um, but if the right tools were there, and if the right communications method were there to include them in the problem-solving equation, it would be a massive untapped force that we could actually tap. At that time, another interesting feature juxtaposed into my thinking. <clears throat> in doing this field trial of genetically engineered crops, 
We actually, by accident, beat Monsanto by one day. It was June 1st of 1987. And a year later, I was giving a talk at UC Davis. And the Monsanto guy with the suit and everything got up there with his fancy slides, talked about the world's first field trial of a transgenic food crop, June 2nd, 1987. I think, Jesus, I'm giving the next talk. And I had these, you know those old slides you used to use, 35 millimeter slides that were dia, the real sophisticated were called diazos. They were white on blue. And they usually had little hairs on them for when they stuck around in your backpack and stuff. And I gave this slide to June 1st, 1987. And I felt really embarrassed to have you know, counteracted this. But the first field trial actually was, was not there by a multinational out to make money. It was there by a public sector institution, the Plant Breeding Institute in Cambridge, to ask a fundamental question, how do things behave in the field? So the public was out to ask the question, how do things act? It's a fairly humble question. Monsanto was out to solve a problem commercially. Humble is not a word that is usually used to describe Monsanto. Okay, so the issue was the public sector wasn't late to the game. It was actually early in the game. What it failed to do was capitalize on that advantage to make sure that public priorities maintained front and center in policy and in science. It capitulated the ground very early. So what I saw, though, was that the work being done in the field was basically intensely reductionist. You would take a concept that you could do in the laboratory and extrapolate it into the field and assume that, well, um, if, if we can do this in the laboratory, that's what we should do in the field. Instead of saying, what is the real world of the field, the economies, how agriculture works, how anything works, and then go back to the laboratory if necessary and build a system that can operate within those real world constraints. That's not the paradigm that was at play. That was the moment when I realized all of these things fit together. Reductionism, per se, was driving the game in life sciences, whether it be public health, whether it be uh, agriculture or natural resource management. So reductionism was driving. The second point that came to, to the head was that most of the people who are committed to solving problems were marginalized from the problem-solving process. These were my colleagues from poorer countries or from areas that did not have the resources to do this work. So the people, the type of science, the people, and what was the other aspect of it that was really critical? Okay, Methodology. It turned out that in the course of a year, I sent this tool. It happened to be called the GUS gene. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that idea, which was simply a gene that we could insert into another organism, which would produce, in some cases, a color that would simply tell you what's happening in the organism. It wasn't out there to fix the organism. It was out there to tell you about something. It was a reporter gene. Okay? In developing that and sending it out to tens of thousands of scientists around the world, what we discovered was very, very fascinating. They all started using it within a matter of weeks or months the entire field had shifted to ask the kinds of questions which that tool could facilitate. So these three things juxtaposed offered an enormous opportunity. If the people who were answering, who were solving problems and experiencing problems were not properly enabled, not properly empowered, if the types of science and types of problems being solved were inappropriately being influenced to be reductionist in nature when the problems were holistic, and if a way to change all of that is to provide technology or tools tools, not solutions, but tools that allow those people to solve those problems in those circumstances, we could see a complete sea change in how the life sciences becomes an engine for uh, economic development and social development. That was the premise that guided the formation of Cambia. Cambia was initially an acronym for the Center for the Application of Molecular Biology to International Agriculture. But if any of you speak any Spanish or Italian, you'll recognize it also means change. Over the last five years, we've stopped using the uh, the acronymic of Cambia because we're way more than molecular biology now. We're looking much more at innovation system reform. And over the last 10 years, we've become very heavily engaged in the world of patents and world understanding what is it that limits the shape of the tool that fits the hand, the hand that wields the tool, and the product that comes from wielding that tool. And it turns out that the patent system is an enormously powerful tool to deny such capability. Recently, I was at a meeting at Yale uh, that my friend Yochai Benkler was running called A2K. It seems like everything has to be an acronym. It's A2K. And I was the sort of the cleanup batter at the meeting speaking. And I proposed that A2K was so yesterday. It was really C2UK, which doesn't lend itself too much. But it's the capability to use knowledge that's the true battleground. If, all, if you're successful, here's a classic thing we learned in physics when I was uh, taking these courses. If you have a, a, a proof that you'd like to test, test it at the 0 and 1 case. Test it at the extremes. If it falls down, which is likely to do at one of those places, then it tells you you're on the wrong track. So let's imagine you're successful. That all the world's information, that Google is, is incredible. All the world's information is available to anyone, anyone, anywhere. Then what? Somehow they have to turn that information to products and services that improve their lives, okay? Into processes that they can engage in which their social or economic well being is enhanced or personal well being. The information 
and in this case, $4 gets you a cup of coffee. The information is a necessary but insufficient condition to social advancement. The capability to use that information is the next battleground. So this is what I'll be telling you then is that in biological innovation, which is the fundamental realm of innovation in our world, it's what produces our food, it's what maintains or destroys our natural resource base. It is actually what produces or destroys the public health that we enjoy or do not. This is biological innovation writ large. To actually produce a change in biological innovation capacity will require the capability to use this information and to find the relevant information to so use. So Cambia was formed initially as an attempt to get the scientific community, as, my, as our first constituency, to focus on methodology, to say, we're using methods ad hoc that just fall off a shelf and assuming that, that whatever is there is what we will use to solve a problem. And this is the classic situation of walking into the hardware store and discovering that there are shelves and shelves and shelves of hammers. And so what a surprise, all the problems are nails. You've heard this many times, if everything, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Interestingly enough, the consequence of that, of that homily is that if you put more exciting tools on the shelf, people will find and discover many, many more opportunities to solve problems than they had before. So Cambia was formed back in the late mid-80s with the concept that if you design a tool specifically to expose new types of problems that occur under real field conditions with real people, and so that it can be wielded by people who may not be economically advantaged, but may be intellectually or morally absolutely committed. What changes can happen? In my assertion, enormous. So we started this under the umbrella of the United Nations. I joined the Food Agriculture Organization of the United Nations as their first molecular biologist. And I tell you, that was a rush. I had a, a, a laissez-passer, United Nations passport, that in the inside a picture of me back with hair and everything, and it said molecular biologist. It doesn't say United States or Australia, it just says molecular biologist. And you know, going through, going through a, a immigration queue sometime, you get up to the front, you have the United Nations passport, and they open it, and it says, oh, molecular biologist. Well. Go right on in, sir. <laughs> it was quite a rush. But then I discovered that those organizations are consensus driven in many, many unfortunate ways. One of the issues is that they have designed themselves, they have e evolved to actually mitigate against individual initiative. So they do not tolerate individual initiative because they cannot, because most individual initiative in those circumstances would be uh, antithetical to their consensus. So what I discovered was setting up Cambia under the aegis of the United Nations would not have worked because it has to be cutting edge, it has to be scary, it has to be pushing in new directions in a new way where even the scientific and academic community will by no means buy in in early days. So did the usual, set it up in, in the front room of a, of a house using savings accounts, and it worked. Now, this is where the patent world came in. I'm, I've decided that to give you this story about the lamp stack, the history is probably a more interesting way to get you to where we are now. What happened was fascinating. We, um, at this point, we was, was me and another colleague, Kate Wilson, who's a terrific scientist. Um, we decided that we would set it up ourselves as a private, independent nonprofit. I mean, unlike some in Silicon Valley, I meant intentionally nonprofit. Um, and, and we set out to do this based on savings accounts. And our assertion was that, well, perhaps if we patent the core methodology, this gust gene I told you about, but then make it available on a tiered pricing basis around the world, we can use revenue from that, from the for-profit sector, to power the next generation of methodology development. So in a sense, use a revenue development method from patents to actually secure enough money to build an institute that would generate the next generation of technologies. And by making it a very low cost, no reach through obligation licensing scheme, we thought what we'll be able to do then is have a, a reasonable and equitable relationship with the business sector, but use that to power what amounts to a social and technological revolution, which is baldly stated what we wish to do. So it turned out to work, but it worked painfully slowly. And in the process, we learned a great deal about the intellectual property system and its abuses and its trajectory. So I did file patents on that GUS system. Luckily, that was in the early days of patenting where the University of Colorado, where I did some of the work, said, ah, it's just a method, nobody's interested. Uh, Cambridge, ah, it's just a method, nobody's interested. In. And so you go into debt, you file the patents, you get into bed with a horrific patent attorney, who actually had an extraordinarily good patent attorney, but it was a horrific event to co-own a technology with somebody that reminds you somewhat of Jabba the Hutt. And, <laughs> Yaba loves patents. And uh, this was a terribly frustrating time in my life because I discovered that I invented the technology, I thought of the technology in 1979, 1980, reduced it to practice to, to genetically engineer the first animals, which were nematodes, in 1983. 
brought it into plants and made it work in 1985 in plants. <clears throat> it wasn't until 1993 that the first patent even issued. And when it issued, it wasn't until 1995 that the first license was taken, over 10 years from the time of conception. Now, in the life sciences, uh, that, I mean, in, in IT, that's generations, of course. In life sciences, it still feels like a long time, but that's how long it takes to develop a product. In the life sciences, uh, there is no feedback loop for successful decisions. So that's why exit strategies are common in Silicon Valley, because exit strategies get you golf club memberships and Alexis for life. The issue of making something of value takes so long that it's very rare that a decision maker that starts something is actually there for the finish. Now in IT, if somebody starts a project here at Google, you're usually still sitting in that seat by the time it succeeds or fails. And if it fails, you hear about it. And if it succeeds, hopefully you hear about it. So there's a feedback loop for successful decisions. Now in the life sciences, even in the old fashioned life sciences, that doesn't work that well. In plant breeding, for instance, it will take over 10 years from the time you do a genetic cross by very conventional means to the time you develop a new variety of plants. 10 years is typical. Sometimes it can be longer. Okay? With a pharmaceutical or a public health practice even, it can take even longer. Now, if that's the case, imagine you've risen to some degree of prominence in your field and you're in your 40s or 50, um, and you make a visionary decision to pursue something, what is the likelihood you're still in that seat 10, 12 years later when it's tested in the marketplace? It's very, very low. That means people occupying that seat have rarely been tested by successful decision making except by a very trivial metric of money, not wealth, money. So that's one of the biggest challenges we face with this, is looking at the metrics for success. If we want to change the direction of, what be, of the problem solving that's out there, we have to look at the metrics for success for that. So that's coming back to the bit of the history. After leaving the UN and setting it up in a sort of the equivalent of a garage, we finally got our first grant, and that was from the Rockefeller Foundation. And the Rockefeller Foundation at that time was funding five or six million dollars a year in rice biotechnology, mostly in Asia, but also Africa and Latin America. And because I'd been very prominent because of the development of that the GUS gene, or very, very, very famous, um, they wanted to actually use that fame to gain access to help troubleshoot the laboratories in Asia that were doing rice biotechnology. So that was my first job where my travel budget was about four times more than my salary. My salary was less than I made as a grad student to go and travel to every lab in China, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, actually turned out West and East and Southern Africa and Latin America. So pretty much everywhere to actually work hands on in the laboratory to troubleshoot, to transfer new technologies, to develop new rice biotech methodologies. So, you know, this was the first, you know, by, that, by this time the savings account was gone, so we took the grant, and I knew that I was going to be a physical wreck if I traveled from, say, the western United States or from Europe to Asia every single week. You know, there are probably people at Google who have to do that, and you bet you they're wrecks, I bet. So I decided, how about Australia? It's in the same time zone as half the world's population and most of the world's rice uh, scientists and rice growers. So I approached uh, some colleagues at the scientific agency CSIRO in Australia and said, how about if I base it there for a year? And they said, sure, sure, we'll offer you an old prefab building in the back of the campus. So I went there for a year, and that was 15 years ago. It turned out that the quality of life and the proximity to half the world's population in the same time zone is an enormous important feature. In fact, unless there's a big seismic event, I mean a really big seismic event, Australia will always be in the same time zone as half the world's population. So in, in the increasingly important world of real-time communications and the unwillingness to do all our work at midnight, uh, Australia is beautifully positioned for quality of life, clean air, and to talk to our colleagues uh, to our north. To our south, too, except that they're penguins. Um, <laughs> uh, or actually, or Kiwis, sorry, New Zealanders. <laughs> Marie's from New Zealand. Um, I don't, <laughs> but they don't want to hear us. So, so that was Cambia. Now, then, then what ended up happening about the whole world of patents, as we began to think about designing new technologies, we realized that the, the interest in finding the design of those new technologies was associated with the ability to make money with technologies. But actually, that's not a, true. The real push in biotech turned out to be making money from technologies. This is a really different thing. I want you to imagine. Imagine if C, programming language, was only available to those who could afford a particular amount. And then, in fact, it, it was exclusively licensed to a few entities. It would not evolve as a language. It would not have the broad, standardized form that it has or the power it has to sculpt higher level languages. Consequently, the industry would be stifled. That turns out to be the standard in biotechnology. As new tool, as new discoveries were made, they would be fashioned or, or prettied up to be inventions, which they often were not. Those inventions would be patented, and the money would be made not by the use of those tools, 
but by the exclusive or semi-exclusive licensing of those tools to others. And so a company would make its money. You talk about the successes of the biotech industry. It's almost always by having the little componentry that's necessary to make a true product and actually flogging it off as, for as much money as possible. Well, that basically is what's called rent extraction in economics terms. It's causing as much uh, rent to be drawn out of the system as possible, which slows down uh, the development of the sector and makes it highly parochial, focusing only on the interests of those who have enough money to pay the price. So it became clear to us that while we were trying to use the patent system to do something interesting, the patent system itself and the business practices surrounding it was evolving to do something utterly different and utterly frustrating. And that was that it was designed to be gamed. And there's an old story that's quite rude that says, why does a dog lick himself? Because he can. And this is exactly what's happened now. Why have the business methods of the biotechnology industry, and recently in IT, why have they evolved in a particular way? Because they can, because the patent system allows a certain type of gaming and it basically extortion. It's often called intellectual property protection. And you may remember that in The Sopranos, protection, what is protection? You know, you pay me a certain amount, I won't break your legs. Okay? In a sense, that's all a patent license is. You're not getting anything except, uh, in a sense, a indemnity from somebody suing you. So we discovered that the patent system per se could reflect both the strength of invention but also the appalling weakness of a business model that was not inclusive because it did not distinguish between tools and products. So as Cambia started developing, Rockefeller gave us a little bit more money and finally, in 1995, we began to see licensing revenue from companies that were using our tool. Um, we started to develop new technologies to explore what would happen by providing new technologies in a different format. And we discovered something else about technology development that can kill it. It's called transaction cost. If I negotiate with Google or with Monsanto, Monsanto, as an example, is, is a licensee of our technologies. It's not a company I, uh, I particularly have affection for, though I know a number of people there that I like. They use the technology in ways that are very effective for their business model kind of uninteresting for mine, but it's, it's there. But it took us three years to close the deal, to license the technology. They have countless lawyers they can throw at it. They can delay as much as they want, because they knew that all they were getting was an indemnification to keep us from suing them. Now, do you think they were frightened of a little struggling startup in Australia suing them? Of course not. We couldn't have afforded to even get to the, get to the courthouse. So consequently, it was almost a matter of good faith that they bothered licensing it at all. But it took us forever. Now, the number of companies, we have maybe 50 or 60 licensees to those early technologies, and each one of them ate a little piece of us. And it took us away from the creative issue of seeing the vision of interacting with human beings, of building technologies. We realized that that mode is dead. The mode of, of high transaction cost licensing has to be put behind us. Now, one of the great powers of the open source revolution in IT is, interestingly, the lack of transaction costs. Basically, here's the rules. If you like it, click here. Get on with it. Use the tools. But you agree to the rules. It's not valuation focused where you say, how much is it worth to you? That's your decision, how much it's worth to you. But you're not expected to pay that. You're expected to pay in performance, in performance behavior, in compliance with the terms. So that lesson of transaction cost was one that we learned very, very painfully at, at quite a high expense. So we realized then that we weren't going to be able to game our technologies that way because what we needed to do was actually provide them to everyone as an incentive to build the next generation. So in a sense, we over 20 years developed, in, quite in parallel to the free and open source software movement, developed the same concepts, but in a world that is influenced by patents, by long timelines, and by a pre-existing gaming mentality. But now this is, according to the abstract, if any of you read that, this is where I actually get to turn back the, the, uh, the Wayback Machine uh, about 4,000 years, because there is this cachet amongst software development that free and open source was really, it's a whole new concept developed in the software world. But in fact, it's about as fundamental a human, oh, I like the blue, the blue screen of death, just in honor of Microsoft. Um, um, <laughs> excuse me, yeah, I'll let Google parse my password. Um, about 4,000, 5,000 years ago, humans started very effectively um, domesticating plants and animals. So until that time, they say until about 10,000 years ago, we were exclusively hunters and gatherers. Whatever was there, we would take, if we could take it. If we could catch it and eat it, we would do so. Ultimately, that proved to be somewhat unproductive in terms of developing free time and developing, sadly, and developing power structures. And so ultimately, it became clear that if you selected particular plants that were better than the ones the generation before and planted those, you would start to develop what ended up becoming agriculture. 
And over the several thousand years of the domestication of plants and animals, virtually everything that we have in our agriculture was developed by a means and by a mechanism that is utterly indistinguishable from the norms of open source software development. That is, it was based around the idea that you can benefit, I didn't say free software, you can benefit from your work as a plant breeder, as a farmer as well, because farmers and plant breeders were the same ones, just as many times the software that, that had been developed prior to Web 2.0 was designed to be used by other software engineers. So I mean, Linux is not designed to be used by me. It's designed to be used by people to write programs that do something on it. Similarly, plant breeders and farmers were the same entity for thousands of years. What happens is in plant breeding, let's take an example of rice. It's a, it's a plant I know extraordinarily well, um, but never enough. Rice is an inbreeding crop. That means that um, the pollen and the egg typically are from the very same plant. Now what that means is to get any variation from one plant to the next or from one generation to the next, you have to do a genetic cross. That is, you rub the pollen from one plant uh, onto the, as it were, the eggs uh, of another plant. And the progeny will have different types of uh, seeds. You plant those and you find one that does better for you. That means it tastes better, it flowers earlier, flowers later, uh, stands taller, stands shorter, does whatever you need, is more resistant to X, Y, or Z. The genetic diversity of the materials that gave rise to the rice plant was enormous. And so was the contextual knowledge of those people that were doing the cross. And this is something that is fascinatingly different between software and the life sciences. And it's a point of huge opportunity for us. What's the difference between uh, somebody programming in C on a Linux box in Bangalore and somebody doing it in Berkeley? Answer, nothing. Ah, but interestingly enough, if you're programming in C, context is exactly what's different, but not for the programming. For the very, very vast majority of programming, if you're programming for a Linux box, it could be running in, in, in Emeryville in a big warehouse or in Bangalore and somewhere else. What, they, what we've done is basically removed context by having standard operating systems, standardized calls, standardized basically demands. Web 2 is changing all that, but basically up until now with software development, we've tried to remove context by homogenizing the operating parameters. In the life sciences, whether it be in public health or health crises or in agriculture, that cannot be done. But interestingly enough, that is exactly what industrialized agriculture has tried to do, where we have actually taken land, whether it be in India, China, Africa, Iowa, and tried very hard to turn it into a model system so that we could then breed plants for that model system and we could make better performance in that model system. And we have seen the consequences, which is that we destroy soil fertility, we destroy rural livelihoods, and in fact, we end up producing uh, an over-endowed super plant that is actually inferior because it cannot grow in diverse environments and produce diverse results. What's ended up happening is that what software engineering is doing now and moving to Web 2.0 is now, in a sense, what the life sciences needs to rediscover. And it needs to rediscover it, not discover it. Because only until 60 or 70 years ago, when hybrid maize started to be developed, and 40, or 40 years ago or so, when the green revolution, which is to get smaller, shorter plants that can take stronger input levels without falling over, until that happened, the idea that each farmer's field, each farmer's paddock was different was considered a truism. Of course they're different. Therefore, the farmer had value in the context. The farmer would understand what is better for my farm or for the market into which I sell my produce, what is better for my regional community because it comes up early enough that I can get the labor pool that I need to do the harvesting now as opposed to the other guy who does it later. And that way, she or he uses the same labor pool later. All of these context pieces of information have been drummed out of it. And so we now have a highly homogenized and in my view, extraordinarily precarious situation in agriculture that is not dissimilar to the early stages of software development in which we only program for a particular unified environment. Once we learn how to have highly diverse, highly diverse user inputs actually sculpting the tools themselves, which is the harbinger of Web 2.0, then we will see a richness and a context dependency that is truly remarkable. And we need that in biological innovation. We need to restore, uh, we need to, maintain the imperatives of uh, reasonable economic success and business models, but we have to restore contextual dependence into that. And that's a huge scientific challenge. This isn't a woolly Birkenstock clad idea of, well, let's go back to the earth. It's nothing like that. It's more like, let's take those lessons, which we have unlearned, relearn them and graft onto that the scientific method and the ambition to do far, far better, but the humility to do it better in the context of other people doing better. This is the key.
what we have to push against. Now, in the patent world, about seven years ago, the Rockefeller Foundation realized that even in rice biotechnology, which they're promoting in the poorer countries of the world, they were discovering that the richer countries, and in particular larger corporations and universities gaming the system, were seeking patents on fundamental processes and fundamental uh, components of the rice genome and, and the rice um, genome engineering capability, and that this was going to inhibit the development of any sustainable sector that would improve rice over the years. And this is a remarkable feature that we have to remember. Because life sciences takes a long time, it means that it takes a lot of confidence in the investment community. Now, that investment community doesn't have to be guys in silk suits. It can be the panchayat. It can be a small consortium of local banks or seedsmen that invest just enough to keep a process going for 10 years. But they need confidence. They need confidence that there's a reasonable likelihood they can deliver at the end and not be crushed by a multinational. The other aspect is in the globalization of agriculture, the likelihood that you're only operating locally is zero. Everyone needs to make some cash to buy school uniforms, to buy medicine, to have free time, to do anything. Um, to get cash, you have to sell. To sell, you these days are always selling into a potentially international market. Even if you're selling in East Africa to a local grain uh, merchant, that grain merchant may wish to have the option in a bumper year or a surplus year to pool it with other grain merchants in an export for production of corn syrup, blah, 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 blah. If you don't have that option, you can't generate the cash. If you can't generate the cash, you can never bootstrap out of poverty. It's one of the most fundamental truisms there is, and yet it is constantly denied in the development set. Poverty is associated with a lack of freedom of options in business development for currently poor people, and that is associated with the tools. And interestingly enough, patents, even patents only in the United States, can grossly undermine business confidence of local scale, small local scale investment internationally. So what I'm talking about now is that to clean up the world's house, we have to clean up our own house, including, including in the United States, and Australia, and Europe, and Japan, and in other industrialized patent jurisdictions. So we have to look at the patent system. And Rockefeller started funding us then to begin which, what was at the time the first public sector, fully searchable, text searchable patent database that was integrated amongst jurisdictions. And we've done that over the years. And, and my, my, my plaudits go to Google for having finally uh, developed Google patents. And let me show you what we've done over the years with patent lens. Marie Kinnett, who's here as deputy CEO, has guided the development over the last two years of the patent lens. Um, and what we've provided are, is not just information and not just search of a patent, even for full text, and not just database of the, con the forms of a patent, but we've tried to provide guidance, cartography, maps in a sense, for the nature of the rights being accorded. And this is very important. Up to, for those of you who, anybody here like history, like just reading history sometimes just to color, okay, let's pretend that you did. Um, in the Middle Ages in Europe, there was a stage, which is still actually, there's still a lot of harmonies with it now, where the preferred solution to any social problem was religion. The only, the only, it was before science. And so if you needed a solution to something that was very challenging, you would seek it in a religious solution. However, that solution through liturgical texts, the interpretation of those texts was denied to the common person and only accessible through clergy that could actually read the liturgical languages, in that case Latin, and often in through illustrated, through illuminated texts that were only selectively available to a few. They would read and interpret those, but only if you even had access to the clergy. And the clergy became an enormously wealthy and an enormously powerful group within uh, the church. What ended up happening, of course, is that spawned a number of what were called by the church heresies and a number of different approaches towards, in a sense, democratizing access to divine knowledge. Well, as science emerged in the last 300 years as a very powerful and reproducible tool to get true, um, verifiable knowledge about the real world, what should happen but basically increasingly a clergy emerges to ensure that the power associated with that is reserved for the select. Now, Science doesn't solve problems. Science creates an understanding for the problem. The so solution usually comes from either process or product that is based on that science. So a, a change in your lifestyle. When science proves that um, smoking causes lung cancer, you can choose not to. If you're lucky enough to resist the blandishments of the industries, you choose not to. That's a lifestyle choice that can improve your life based on a scientific knowledge base. Or you can buy a medicine or a plant, but only if someone has made those. So the real issue is science is not the real clergy. It's those that interpose between science and solutions. And in the last 40 or 50 years, that has increasingly become the world of patents. Patents have actually been the, the, the crucial 
liturgical language, really, of science in action. Patents are not about science. They're about the conversion of science into perceived economic value. And that specialized language and capability has emerged as the ecclesiastical elite. What we wish to do is democratize that process. We need the business people anywhere, small business people, very small business people in any part of the world, are able to make a reasonable determination of greenfield versus minefield in the world of patents. You, are, are all of you familiar with what patents really are? All a patent is is the right to stop someone else from doing something. If I have a patent on this cup of coffee, it doesn't give me a right to drink it. It just gives me a right to prevent you from drinking it. In fact, it only gives me a right to sue you if you try to drink it. So I can't actually physically stop you. There is no jackbooted patent police I can call upon. But I can, however, call a silk-suited lawyer to file a writ and blah, 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 blah. So a patent is a right to stop, to invoke civil law to stop someone from doing something, but doesn't give you a permissive right. And this is its, is its critical. Um, uh, Achilles' heel. And by understanding the nature of these rights, we can actually map out areas of freedom and decency where you don't actually have to navigate the rights. Or if the rights are reasonably provided, we can license the rights. But if they're unreasonably provided, collectively, if we have the landscape, we can navigate beyond it. And we can actually create new opportunities to provide a pathway. So there was a very good paper written by a man named Ken Kukier. Anybody's interested in this topic in Nature Biotechnology, which is the preeminent journal in the biotech field, something about navigating the, uh, the IP landscapes or something. It's a really good paper. What is it? The patent maze. Thank you. And the analogy he uses in that, uh, in that paper is, is extremely colorful and useful. And that is that in the early days, coming back to history, the great European empires were formed largely because of control of trade. And their control of trade was based on maps. If you understood the safe way, and sometimes the only way, to get from hither to yon, where yon would have nutmeg, or yon would have whatever you wanted to sell, then you had massive commercial advantage over the others. So what ended up happening is those who controlled the, the cartography, the maps, the, the secret paths, were in the position of massive economic and military power. Those maps are the future, to know where it is safe to go, how you can get there, and do useful things. And interestingly enough, right now, patents in their raw form are in complete absence of such a map. So the patent lens is an attempt, and we hope in collaboration with Google, will be a better attempt to actually try to create a visible, a visible cartography where any human being who has a wish to solve a problem can recognize whether that problem is already solved by someone else, which is an interesting issue, uh, whether it's unsolved but unsolvable in the current skein of rights, or whether, in fact, there is a pathway that can be taken that can deliver a viable, cost-effective solution. So what I want to do is wrap this concept up now with a vision of something really very tangible. So I've talked sort of effervescently and ethereally about tools and whatnot. I'm going to talk about a real one that we're working on in the lab. We're a very small institution, like staggeringly small sometimes. Like I'm not sure that somebody's there to turn on the lights now that Marina are here. But here's one of the things we're doing. Um, the, original, the original act of gene transfer, of actually moving a gene from uh, the test tube, actually, originally, into a plant. Let's say you want to make a plant that's resistant to nematode attack or um, that makes a more nutritious seed. Okay. Let's say you'd like to do that. The very first act is to, besides actually coming up with an idea, is to transfer it into a plant. Now, the way that is typically done throughout the world right now is using a natural tool called agrobacterium. In the soil, if you have a garden, uh, in the soil, I can promise you there are millions, millions of these bacteria called agrobacterium tumefaciens. No matter where your garden is, there will be millions of these bacteria. They have evolved a phenomenal capability. That capability is to be a small Trojan horse. What happens is that uh, agrobacterium over millions of years has evolved the ability to associate itself with plants that are wounded, and then to insert into that plant a small snippet of code of DNA. What that code does when it integrates, as it's called, into the plant genome, is it is a true parasite. It goes in there and it says, make this plant form a gall or tumor. And so the plant goes by making a lot of hormones. It shouldn't, right? Or it shouldn't. It doesn't normally, I should say. And that's a home for the bacteria. So it starts multiplying. But that's not enough. The bacteria also puts into that little inserted code the ability to say, now I want this plant to synthesize compounds, uh, chemical compounds that only I can eat. And the plant then starts doing that. So in this gall, it's producing these compounds called uh, opines. Um, which only that agrobacterium can eat. So what a clever biological system. It turns out it doesn't kill the plant. The plant just makes a bump, 
that feeds the bacteria, which live in the bump and eat the, eat the compounds. It's an incredibly clever scheme. But to the eye, it looks just like any other plant disease. And 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, everyone assumed it was because the bacterium was a conventional pathogen. You'd rub it on a plant, it would uh, make a disease like other plant diseases or, or lesions on any of us. Turns out that it was only 35 years ago, 30 years ago, in fact, that it was discovered that this unique process of transferring a piece, snippet of DNA was happening. And it was thought at the time it's the unique example in the entire world of interkingdom gene transfer. And so we thought, well, why don't we get rid of the deleterious genes that make tumors and, and opines and put in something sensible that's helpful for the plant, uh, helpful for agriculture. The basic concept of plant genetic, uh, genetic engineering was contingent on that, and it worked. But of course, what ended up happening? It, all the fundamental discoveries were made by universities, and the Max Planck Institute, the University of Ghent, University of Washington, and just confusingly, Washington University in St. Louis, all did some of the fundamental biology of that. And they all filed patents on it. And this was back in the 70s or in the early 80s. Now, what ended up happening? They sat there latently like a time bomb, a submarine. Now, the technology everyone was using. But then pretty soon, the patents started surfacing and firing the torpedoes till fewer and fewer people had the rights to do this. And now, in fact, there are only two companies in the world that own uh, really the dominant rights to that, Monsanto and Bayer, a German company. Um, and interestingly enough, virtually everybody else has been crushed out of the industry. So what a surprise that there's public uh, dissatisfaction and unease about genetic engineering at around the same time that it's become, instead of a robust industry done by public and small private sector, but instead being a large monolithic enterprise by an opaque private sector. Does that sound at all familiar in your industry? Because if it does, it also is associated with some of our vision of how can we prove to people that it doesn't have to be this way. So we set out to, to, to th say, how can we analyze this patent thicket? So we spent some years analyzing four or 500 of the top patents. If you can imagine four or 500, there's actually more. The top couple of tier of patents around agrobacterium transformation. And that's available in what we call a patent a technology landscape. And um, it took us a long time to do this, which also taught us that it's not a sustainable enterprise to do this as a, a one-off with one team like this. So we did these technology landscapes. Sorry about your bandwidth here. Um, It'll come up. You don't want to read it anyway. And realize that, again, there was an Achilles heel. And the Achilles heel is the classic one that lawyers always cleave to, and that is definitions. From the earliest days, the definition was, based on our scientific ignorance, they would say that any process that uses agrobacterium tumefaciens to do blah, 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 blah. And we started reading these, and we read more and more and more of these patents and analyzing them and realized, well, wait a minute. Well, if we convinced a different bacteria, could find a different bacterium that's not agrobacterium, a different genus, a different family of bacteria, then all these patents would suddenly become irrelevant. And then I thought, well, what would happen then if we just put it out in the public, build it, and they will come? Well, then somebody's going to improve it, and they'll file a patent on that, and it'll begin the thicket all again. So that's when we conceived many years ago of the idea of what is now called biological open source, which is to use patent licensing to generate the same freedom of innovation space that is now achieved in the free and open source software movements. So what we did is we. We actually invented a new technology for gene transfer. That is that we moved the capability from agrobacterium into a completely different family of bacterium that was a benign bacterium, not a pathogen at all, but just one that's associated with, um, with the growth of nitrogen-fixing root nodules, it's called. And it turned out that it worked. And two years ago, almost exactly, we published this in the journal Nature, which is a very prominent journal also. And at the same time, we went live with a collaborative infrastructure to try to build and improve on this and a licensing scheme that took a very interesting concept. And that was, we want everyone to use it, even Monsanto, for free. We don't want a penny of your money. Well, I mean, we'd like it, but we're not going to ask for it. Uh, and we want to use it for free. But here's, the, here's the, the catch, the mouse click. And the catch is, and by the way, you know, the visitor's non-disclosure agreement is amazing. It's incredible, like three-point text like this just says, oh, except. <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine what I signed. Um, so what, what people assign when they take license, they say, you can use this technology not just for research. You can use it not just for humanitarian purposes, but to build an industry, to do anything you like. We don't want a piece of your success. We do, however, want you not to rain on anyone else's parade. So you agree that if you get any rights from any other third party or if you develop something that would dominate this technology, you agree to license those to every other licensee for free under the same conditions. Sounds familiar? It is familiar. And how about another one, which is a non-assertion? Okay, If you have those rights, you agree not to ever assert them. You don't have to just license them, but you don't assert. Okay, What's another one? 
Well, if you learn anything about the biological safety of this technology, you share it with everybody. And the final thing is, if you make improvements that you wish to protect yourself, okay, you make serious improvements to this technology, you must share those with other licensees. Or just keep them secret yourself. So in other words, it allows somebody to build a culture of, you know, I can do it faster in-house if they want. But I think they'll see that productively it's better to share. But we don't want the transaction costs of, of drilling down into their notebooks and things like that. So these three provisos have been pretty attractive. And since then, we've now got many, many licensees of this, including the largest agrochemical company in the world, BASF, which has realized that as it came late to the biotech game, if we take out this license and start the ball rolling in this, we really can do something special, meaning they don't have to pay for a technology. They can actually put their money into product development, which is a sensible business strategy. So it's moving. This, one of the largest seed companies in India, JK AgriSeeds, uh, has licensed this. And we decided to do something interesting. We say that if you want to support our, this initiative, we have a totally separate technology support agreement where, based on the size of your company, you can contribute a certain amount of money per year just to keep us alive. It's non-compulsory. And so far, everybody has done it. But what we've done is saying in the non-OECD countries where cash may be an issue, we want to do technological and business affirmative action. I want to see big industries competing with Monsanto based in India, like the, like the generics did for a long time. Uh, knock on wood. So what we do is say, OK, JK AgriSeeds, you can license it for free. And you can have a technology support agreement in place which keeps us going. But instead of giving us money for that, you find and identify a, and fund a mid-career scientist somewhere from India, assign them to us for three years. We'll train them as cutting-edge patent analysts, and they will build technology landscapes for the public on the web. They go back to a really well-paid job to work with this company where they've already had the red pill of open source, and they've helped the community in general understand the landscapes. It's a really remarkable idea. So the final one I'm going to close is to say with, so what? We talked about a tool like that of genetic engineering alternative ways. Is that really where we want to go, that have a bunch of companies doing genetic engineering? To be honest, I'm not really very interested in that concept. You know, we have to break the monopoly so that people have a choice to say no because of their wishes, not mine. But more importantly, we have to give them something positive. So this is where I'm going to leave you with the molecular heuristic that I started the whole thing on. Imagine this. Imagine a farmer planting a field and not knowing what's in the soil. What you're just imagining happens every day in every farmer's field. They don't know what's in there. They don't know how much nitrogen, how much phosphate, how much water, how many pathogens. The soil is the unknown information. The weather is the unknown information. We don't know any of these things. What if you did? What if you could actually not just plant your crop, but plant another plant that produces a plant that produces a color? And that color is an instrument. It tells you how much nitrogen is there. It's a bioindicator. Imagine that genetic engineering is not used to make a higher yielding crop, but imagine that it's used to make instruments that tell you what is in the soil, how much nitrogen, how much phosphate, whatever else. So a farmer, for the first time in human history, will not be wading into the unknown, will actually be able to use an instrument that they can get from another farmer across the field, because it will cost nothing. It's a biological organism. It's a seed. It costs them nothing to plant. And it's their own knowledge and their own commitment that determines the response to that information. This is kind of Web 2.0, but in the field. The idea, then, is that the organism senses things. Plants do anyway. And we, we adjust it through genetics to modulate that, transduce the information into a form that anyone can understand, okay? and then they can decide what to do. Nitrogen is the single most important and limiting nutrient other than water in agriculture worldwide. And it's invisible. What if every farmer had the option to plant a, an indicator plant that would start to turn orange on the tips of the leaf when there was not enough available nitrogen? That farmer would, for the first time, be able to make a decision. Do I take out a loan to buy uh, urea? Do I actually cycle it with organic nutrients? Do I, uh, do I rotate crops with legumes to do it? There are many, many, many options. But that farmer will, for the first time, have the intellectual and informational power to make those determinations herself. This is a phenomenal opening to use bioindicators. We're not trying to own the process. We're trying to share capability. So the Lemelson Foundation, based out of Portland, is supporting us a little bit in getting this bioindicator idea off the ground. In a sense, it's the Apollo project of this entire BIOS initiative. By focusing on something which revolutionizes the ability of people worldwide to make their own decisions and their own economic development, and all the componentry that's necessary, we're asserting that we can build a true lamp stack for the life sciences, where basically the ability to have all of the tools, put them together in a heuristic, in a measurement device like this, 
or a group of measurement devices in an open source setting where anyone can use them in different combinations to make their own instruments that do interesting things, we think can afford the revolution both process-wise in transaction costs, intellectual property-wise, and more importantly, socially, in how you solve problems and who are allowed to solve problems. So it strikes me that this is, in a sense, Google writ large in the life sciences. It isn't about using IT for the life sciences. It's using the philosophy that embodies Google's success into the life sciences. It's really about getting other people to solve problems. The reason Google is wealthy is because you've made other people wealthy. By allowing them to make decisions based on better information, you have created wealth in the world and in the process become a wealthy company. What we wish to see is the same type of revolution in the life sciences, where this time those four billion people that can't afford that latte become empowered to become wealthy. And if that happens, it's going to be because they have better decision-making capability and more respect given to their ability to do so. So what I'm hoping happens from this is that Google as an entity, whether it's the .org or the .com, realizes that we have an, a unique time-limited opportunity to push the boundaries into a form of philanthropy that is anything but top-down. It's anything but top-down, and it's totally inspired by the successes that have made Google success. So that's why I want to leave it and take any questions you have right now. So thank you. Thanks, thank, thanks to both of you for coming. <laughs> so, all right. All right. What do you think that philanthropy looks like, concretely? Not much. And, and, and this, is, this is an interesting, I don't mean to make that a glib statement. For a long time, I tried to look for a sustainable business model that would generate revenue so that we could do this. It's not expensive to do what I'm talking about. My guess is that a seven or eight year program for what I, what, in fact, when I was at SciFu here a few months ago, um, I gave a little extempore talk about this, where I, I, that's where I first coined the concept of calling it a lamp stack for life sciences, and John was at, that's where I met John. And I picked a number out of the air, not completely arbitrarily, that it was probably going to be about $8 million a year for seven or eight years, and then it has a life of its own. Now, in the overall federal budget or any budget for public research, that's small change. So we're talking about a very small amount of money. And it's not about a monolithic institutional issue. One of the interesting great features of the free and open source movement is it taught us that properly managed, diverse and, and highly distributive innovation can be very, very effective, and that there are new incentive methods that can bring things out of the woodwork that already exists. You don't have to reinvent a lot of wheels. So there's a company called Innocentive. Are you aware of that? It's, a, it's an interesting little company. Well, now it's getting bigger. There was a spin-off of Eli Lilly, the drug company. And it was a fascinating observation that, that many, many corporations, for instance, that do physical things like process chemicals, need a process engineering trick that somebody already knows. And they know somebody knows it somewhere. They know it's out there somewhere, but they need it. Now, it's not a big proprietary thing. It's just they need the efficiency. So what they did is, in a sense, this guy, Alpheus Bingham, who started the company as a spinoff, decided to start posting challenges and financial rewards. It's incredibly simple. It said that anybody who knows how to do the ion exchange of this resin or such and such in a way that costs less than such and such. Give us a reasonable way to do it, and you'll get 10,000 bucks. And lo and behold, it turned out that there were scientists at, at, at universities and companies that I know how to do that. And they would actually go in there and submit this thing under confidentiality and say, if you do it this way and this way. They didn't try to own it. They just said, I can solve your problem, and I can get some money. Boom, done. It wasn't a matter of research. It's a matter of pulling things out of the woodwork, a very clever idea. But why not harness that for? in a sense, this true Apollo project. The reason I call it an Apollo project is because if you think about what that entailed, it wasn't really about the moon. That was sort of the vision of what you want to see happen. But really what it was about is developing enormous industrial and technological capability and building the psychological self-confidence, in this case, of a nation. Both of those are what we want to do in the life science. You want to build the psychological self-confidence in, in human beings that are, out of the, that are disenfranchised. They can solve problems. And we want to build a new technological capability. So the metaphor of the Apollo project is sensible, but the expense is different by a factor of thousands and thousands. So what if the, what if the philanthropy came in kind instead of in money? So for example, obviously, you know, you're very good at information. Mm -hmm. What would it look like for information well, an ex this is a great question. Fantastic question. You're already doing that, in a sense, without meaning to. Uh, when you launched Google Patents a little while ago, it was a delightful step, because it basically, even though we've been doing stuff like this for years and years, we don't have your infrastructure. We have a total of eight developers at Cambia. And so obviously, the synergies, because we know a lot about the business rules of patents, the synergies between Cambia and Google in the informatics arena are potentially very, very high. 
In a sense, we're the weirdest company on earth because we want to go out of business. Our job is to see our worldview so commonplace that we're unnecessary. So if the Google patent analysis capability became as sophisticated as we imagine, and if it proved good business for Google, I wouldn't care, as long as that capability is there for the rest of the world. Then we don't have to spend money on, on developers and struggling to buy patent data sets. Then it becomes a worldwide public good. So, that's a classic example where the, the capabilities that are already in-house or in-houses here um, can be leveraged marvelously, the informatics capability and the communications capability. Another is this. When I launched this two years ago, we launched it two years ago, some of you know Brian Bellendorf, who runs the Apache Foundation and has been signally important in, um, in developing that, that tool. Um, he offered us the use of his CollabNet capability. CollabNet is his company which provides um, distributive software development um, tools, basically. And so we went live with something called the BioForge two years ago. And it was a re resounding failure. Uh, and it was a resounding, I, I, I just realized I signed the form saying this could be broadcast. It wasn't, it was a learning experience, I said that to the camera. Because what it taught us was that the culture of an innovation community matters far, far more than the bits and bobs or the software or the anything else. You have to think of the culture of the innovation community. Software engineering has a totally different culture and a different set of needs than life sciences innovation. So the toolkit available in, whether it was subversion or, or, or repositories or anything that's available to software engineer are totally irrelevant to a life scientist who might take three years, four years to do a piece of science and where most of the time is offline. So there's no gratification being online. Most wet scientists in the life sciences go online to check email or to do a couple of surfs, but they're not there. They don't do their innovation online. So what we discovered is building the BioForge was very much a field of dreams. We built it and they did not come because in fact we hadn't tailored it to the incentives and the motivations of that community. So it was a great learning experience. And now we realize is that as the new capabilities that are called sadly web 2.0 are coming out, we're seeing that they're tailored around adjustability or tailorability to the community we're not going to have to reinvent that wheel. That many of the communications and, and, and um, incentivization tools can be grafted onto the current sorts of interfaces. The wet science can't be done by in-kind. I mean, ultimately, people can contribute, but you have to be able to coordinate it. That's the issue. I don't think most of the, the Apollo project will be done in our laboratories, which are small. We have to have a small capability to maintain our currency and quality assurance over components. But basically, it'll be done by using tools like the Innocentive, which again, is an informatics uh, interface. There has to be a communications part of it, a validation part of it, and a, um, uh, a quality control part of it. These are all things done on a website. So again, it's the sort of thing that we can tap into Google skills for in principle. Um, but ultimately, somebody who has to know the industries, know the life sciences, has to do wet science in a laboratory, in a field, things like that. That's best done by highly distributive innovation that uses incentives uh, to pull things out of the woodwork if they exist already, or to stimulate their creation rapidly. It's not going to be an academic exercise. It's not going to be publish it in top journals. It's going to be solving fundamental tool development challenges. So, a lot of potential in kind, but there's also cash issues. I mean, we're a small institution and we have to convince, I'm going from here tomorrow to the Wellcome Trust, which is the world's largest private medical philanthropy who are quite interested in this topic, and to Rockefeller right after that, who have been interested in us for a long time, to try to develop a consortium of out-of-the-box thinkers who don't want to see top-down linear philanthropy, but want to see something so catalytic that it makes people's breath uh, stop for a while, thinking, could this be a different way of doing business? parsing the patents, rendering the whole patent system transparent so that its excesses can be fully understood and the consequences of bad decisions can be anticipated uh, or visualized. They can't right now. There's Everybody who's arguing about patents is arguing about something of which they are fully and comprehensively ignorant because no one knows. For instance, in the next week, Maria is publishing on our, on our web facility, and probably in the journal Nature also in the next few weeks after that, the first analysis, really, of gene patenting that is comprehensive. It turns out that some friends of ours at MIT about a year ago, a little over a year ago, published a paper indicating that at that time, their analysis showed that over 20% of the human genome had already been patented, which was shocking. What's more shocking is that our discovery was that the data sets they based it on were grossly incomplete. It turned out that GenBank, which holds the world's, uh, is the main repository for DNA sequence information, is only as good as the supplied data that they get, they receive. And the amount of data about patented DNA sequence they had was a fraction of what there really was. So our guys have worked with um, the patent offices, with GenBank, with others, and discovered that in the granted applications, it's what, maybe 30 or 40 percent 
more than that, and in the, in, I'm sorry, in the granted patents, and the applications, the things coming down the pike, it's seven or eight times as many sequences are claimed. And unless you understand that, it's, it's hopeless. And so we built into that the query interface called BLAST, where you can actually take a DNA sequence that you may have discovered and challenge it against the entire now patent and patent applications data set. So what we'll be publishing is the technology landscape on the rice genome and the Arabidopsis genome, another small plant. And we've discovered is, is a horrific, horrific truth and it's the tip of the iceberg. So the first thing we need is utter transparency in the patent system so that its excesses can be either cured or eliminated. Uh, and any of its strengths, and there are a few, can be shored up. So there's lots and lots of rooms to interaction. So two more questions for you. Mm. One, can you be specific about um, what it is that your patent lens does that Google Patent Search doesn't yet do that you would like to see here? And the other question is, Sounds like you've identified information around patents as being one of the places that, um, if the information was better, it would, no, it would, it would enable the, your work to go forward. And uh, is there any other any other place where an information need or an information search need um, you've identified that that's something that could be that if it was solved or better or improved, it would help enable your work. Yeah, the, sec the second one is a wonderful and very broad question. The first one, the first question can be answered very specifically, and one of the reasons Marie has also joined us here is because she's been leading the team that actually can give you utter chapter and verse about the enhancements in the patent lens or the patent search capability that we think add value and that in the future can add much more. So rather than going prolix about that right now, what I can say briefly is that, is that there is embodied in the different classical database fields of a patent, a huge amount of information that is currently largely missing. In the, in the, I mean, basically, the, pat, the search right now on Google is, as far as I can see, in its very earliest implementations. And it doesn't embody the ability to search for many discrete fields and actually to query them with complex database-styled queries. And that is going to be important. For instance, one that we're just releasing, is it released today or about the, uh, the, the term? OK, but it'll be released in the next week or so in the public. Is searching for patent term. One of the classic problems of patents is that everybody assumes that if you see a published patent, it's because it's a published right, and it's not. The, a huge number of patents have lapsed. And so what's interesting is that it's a wealth of technology, in many cases, that you're free to use, but people don't know that. So to be able to search for, for instance, search for everything with the keywords of compression algorithm and blah, 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 um, which expired on or before next Tuesday or next year if you're doing a, a business. Remember, it's not a criminal offense in most cases to actually infringe a patent, so it's a business decision. So if you decide you can keep it all in-house for two years and use that technology until the patent expires, it's, you know, it's up to you. It's a business risk, but you can do it. But the ability to search for patent term uh, and constrain your search based on that is very important. Uh, the ability for virtually anybody to uh, look for related documents in different jurisdictions. It's going to be utterly critical that we understand the growing uh, patent jurisdictions in what we call the CJK character set, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. Um, it is utterly critical. And that's going to be an interesting OCR challenge. Um, but what's particularly interesting is that almost all of the context-dependent issues that we use in, in other types of languages don't work in the same way. As you, I'm sure there are huge numbers of experts in this company that know that. So understanding the Chinese system is not so much important for the US, though it is, or Australia, there is, but it's important to establish this openness within China as well. I mean, don't forget, you've got 1.2 billion innovators in, who utterly need a productive, environmentally sound agriculture. And right now, one of the biggest problems I see, having done 30 working visits in China, is that the environment is going to hell in a handbasket faster than you can even imagine because of abuses in, in an unsustainable agriculture necessary to keep things alive. So internal development, it's not a matter just of finding out what the Chinese are doing. Have the Chinese find out what the Chinese are doing and develop a better internal structure. And the same is certainly true in India. And the rapaciousness in the WTO world of, of foreign multinationals in controlling has to be illuminated by looking at relationships in business terms. So this is one that I think is hugely important that we're not able to do very well because we can't afford the database access. Most companies have many, many affiliates and subsidiaries. Many patents are owned only by those subsidiaries and affiliates. If you don't know the relationship, the ownership relationships, you know nothing about the power relationships. Patents are about power. Did you know that virtually every patent up there has one piece of information that is the most important that is not publicly available, and that is who has the rights? There could be, there could be a thousand patents from the University of California. In fact, there are many more than that. 
and not one of us has a mechanism of asking, well, who has the rights to these? Because it'll only show, as a matter of record, the owner of the document and the process, the patent application and the patent grant, not the owner of the rights. They can make an exclusive and quite confidential assignment of full rights to Monsanto, to Microsoft, anybody else, and we have no matter of public record to find that out. A great service if we can put our heads together and figure out a way to demand policy-wise that that simple matter of who has the rights to this patent, which should be the nature of it. You know, when the patent system was developed, it was, it was developed on the nod and a wink that when you grant the patent to somebody, they actually do the thing. You know, when it was my great-great-granduncle, Thomas, that uh, started the US patent system. He was, the, he was the Secretary of State at the same time as being the patent examiner. Imagine the standard of, of novelty and non-obviousness uh, non to get it past Thomas Jefferson. He actually demanded often working models of things, but because of the law, it's fairly easy in the law to say what you can't do, and it's almost impossible to say what you can. It's the nature of, of, of grants, of, 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 of rights granting. One of the interesting features is that in the early days of the patents, it was with a nod and a wink. That is, we grant you formulated this right to exclude others. But the nod and a wink was, however, you'll do this thing. So in other words, if Eli Whitney applies to make a cotton gin, the understanding was that you get the patent, but it, with the understanding you're going to make a cotton gin out of it, not just stop everybody else and not sell the rights to somebody that we don't know. So interestingly enough, what has now happened is that that transference of rights has become a completely opaque world where it's, it's as if you're fighting a battle with blinders on. You have no idea who has rights, and they can come to get you. In fact, they can destroy the IT industry if they're used incorrectly, and they are certainly already doing it and guiding unfortunate business tools in business models in the biotech industries. So finding out who has what rights is not trivial. It's hugely difficult. There are ways to parse some of it. Other ways, we have to change policy. But you, know, you guys are fairly influential in policy change, too. So there's another area where some real force can be brought to bear. In ter uh, second question, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> so it was a really interesting so you one. Identified, yeah. You identified this whole area of yeah. patents as a really important yeah. type of information that. Oh, the other types of information. So that is there any other sort of information oh, type? Oh, God. One of the dreams I had, and I, there's, there's going to be a lot of answers to that, but that's a creative question that requires me to sit around and drink a bottle of wine and think about it, which I can't do right now. Because I, you know, that's it's previous bottles, of previous bottles of wine, from what I can remember. Well, I, I, one of the classic situations in, in managing natural resources, including in farming, but in, this is also true in public health, is that nobody knows what anybody else is doing. So one of the initiatives that I know is going on somewhere, the INSTEAD program, is about trying to use information to look at um, hints of latent public health crises before they happen. The same can be done with natural resource management and with farming conditions. So the issue of, of abiotic stress, which would be by abiotic, it's not organisms, is one, but biotic stress is also. We don't have a simple way of mapping migration of, in real time of locust or mapping real-time migration, even on a modest scale, of, of insects or pathogens that could be of fundamental importance and for which you can develop prophylaxis. Uh, an example that actually overlaps with our ideas of the bioindicators, in fact, very strongly, is that uh, if you've ever been up to Napa area or any of the great wine-growing areas of the world, of course, the greatest being Australia, uh, what you'll see is that at the end of pretty much every vine row, you'll have a rose bush. Not purely for the aesthetics of the rose, though that's a sort of an upside, it's because the rose bushes are more sensitive to fungal pathogens than the vines are. When you start to see the rose bush wilt, you know that only at that point do you bother to spray, say, with a Bordeaux mixture or a, a, a fungicide. What's great about that is it saves money, but it also saves the environment. The more information you have about both abiotic and biotic stresses in the environment, overlaid with mapping capabilities in real time, the more thoughtful information that farmers are, and, and natural resource managers will have to be able to bring to bear. So big answer to your question is huge yes in terms of real-time 
biological and abiotic parameters that can be sourced and understood by farmers in local languages. Imagine, for instance, um, I've done a lot of work in the south of India uh, and where there's a lot of problems with migratory pests coming in. Now imagine that you actually, or any extension agent, had the ability to look on a, a variant of Google Biomaps to actually look for a report and easily, from the user's perspective, could, could have inputs put in, as inputs are inclined to be, put in inputs, put, inputs uploaded, to know that the brown plant hoppers have been sighted at this position, this position, this position. So imagine that the interface to a, a Google Biomap could actually have um, information put in by users that talks about the prominence of particular organisms or, or whatnot. So the biological inputs of organism density, of environmental parameters into that, so it becomes a true interfacial uh, development, are enormous, un, unfathomable, they're so big. Uh, one of the great successes, if you want to call it that, of, of modern agriculture is called precision agriculture. Uh, it's based on knowing with these, they have these giant John Deere's with GPS's going out through, through Iowa, and they know which paddock, they, they're trained, as it were, which part of the field doesn't have enough X, Y, or Z so that they don't put as many seeds there, they put more of the fertilizer or whatever else. And that's all automatic. Well, we already have these. They're, called, they're not John Deere, they're just people. The issue is they lack that information about the particular paddock. So imagine also that the environmental upload of uh, soil and water conditions is also available. So when you do Google Maps, you can say, show me what's known of soils here. Show me what's known of uh, nutrient deficiencies. So you can then, this is where it gets really exciting, you can then find community. Let's say you say, show me a place in the world that has similar constraints. And it finds you a place. And you say, give me a name of a guy or a person to talk to who lives there and works there. It gives you that, you say, and you put them on Skype or whatever else, and um, you say, hey, how do you actually handle the rice when you've got this infestation of brown hoppers? And they say, well, actually, I just grow a cane, a cane row on the side of it, and it grows da 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 The ability to have, con you know, what you said about context is to actually ask questions about related context. At this point, we can't do that. Nobody knows how to do that. But when I look at Google Map, which is discouragingly accurate, um, I mean, I can actually see the car parked in front of my house on the day it was taken. And then, Who was that? Who was visiting? It's a pool cleaner. Get over there. Um, and you look at that, and you think, well, somebody who lives near there, if I can communicate with them and ask them how they handle these parameters, these, these biological or abiological stresses on their field, it would be phenomenal. So getting the human side of it in there is fantastic if people, in a sense, were registered for their communication capability around a particular geographical location and were willing to share knowledge back and forth. What you'd have is a revolution amongst farmers, farmer to farmer, peer to peer, solving of problems without always going through um, a bottleneck of an expert. Sometimes that's a terrible disaster because the expert promotes themselves by denying such access selectively. So huge, I mean the answer to your question would take me uh, weeks and leaders to, to properly brainstorm, but I've been thinking about it for 20 years as, as Marie and, and it's just wonderful what could be done for field-based agriculture for poor countries because they're not poor in commitment, they're not poor in context knowledge, they're just poor in confidence in the tools. And you can do a lot for both. Uh, so this open source, open science tool development, can that be anytime sustainable? Nah, it's all a failure. <laughs> I think so, I think so, and the reason I think so is because we can make a distinction between tools and products. So similarly, we would ask you in IT, I assume that you in, are in the software world, or okay, it's a safe guess here. Um, I can ask you, is it sustainable that programming languages, operating systems, uh, interoperability standards, and whatnot, should be freely shared? Of course, in fact, it's almost unthinkable that it wouldn't be. So my view is that not only is it sustainable, what it does mean is that we disrupt the status quo. The current business models in biotech are, in my view, short-sighted, and inadequate because they are based around not sharing those core tools. My view is those business models must die. We have to have business models that are about products and services, not denial of access. So in the short term, it's going to be hard, very hard, because we have entrenched interests that say, we are making money. And then people say, well, see, they're making money. Yes, but how are they making money and what, at what cost to the community at large and to wealth creation at large? So when you look at the number of Me Too drugs uh, out there, you say, well, why? When people say you have to have patents for pharmaceutical innovation, you say, why? And the other aspect, when I listen to, uh, when I go to Davos and I listen to the big bigwigs talk about uh, global health, within about seven or eight milliseconds, it segues into a discussion about pharmaceuticals. 
which is insane. Uh, it's just that that's the one that has a, a mature, if corrupted, business model where you can get a recurring revenue stream. If you really want public health, you want something where there's basically no medical costs and enormous social gain from it. But that isn't discussed because the business models aren't there. So yes, it is absolutely sustainable as soon as we establish some exemplary uh, businesses that can use these and people start looking at them. I mean, when people ask me always, you know, how do you make money on open source? This is the funniest uh, talk I have. People say, well, you know, the models for making money in the open source world. And then people are saying, well, you could put yourself like Red Hat or you could, you know, do services. And I say, well, wait a minute. How do you make money with open source? You make your money by using it. Not from open source, but with open source. And I say, well, Google is probably the classic example of the most profitable company in the world that makes it with open source. Now, you use plenty of proprietary stuff, but you use gobs of open source as well, and you use it to make money. That's how to make this a sustainable business model, is you get people to stop thinking of the tools of biotech and the genes as a way to game it to make money, but instead as a way of using it to create wealth. So when we get a few examples of companies that are brave enough to take that gamble, then people will see it's sustainable. In the short term, no. Short term, we're going to have to drive it. The thing is, when, when you start a, okay, we have developed a so now the question is to put that to the open source or the use of yourself for your own. So immediate answer, uh, for the short-term games, yeah. it would be always to keep it for that. Yes and no. One of the interesting things about the life sciences, and I suspect this is true of software engineering, is that the first version never is very good. And the interesting feature is, do you have, remember that for a company to use a tool, let's say the gene transfer tool, you actually have to meet not just the permission to use it, but also the cost effectiveness of your process. It has to be efficient enough to make it in your business. Now, it's very rare that a company has the capability of, of not only coming up with an idea and protecting it, but also making it cost effective to work in your business. For that, you need to leverage other people's inputs. So what's interesting is that the, almost the only way you can make money from that initial sort of tool development is by basically, as we would say in, in cricket, querying the pitch, by ba basically making it so difficult for other people to proceed that they buy you out. And that's the exit strategy for a lot of startups, is you invent this tool, you're not planning on building a pharmaceutical with this, you're not planning on engineering a new plant, you're planning on being so irritating to a Monsanto or a Pioneer or a Merck that they buy you out and you make yourself personally wealthy. But what has it done to the sector in general? Not a lot. In fact, not a lot positive and a lot negative. So my assertion is we're not looking for small business models right now that are making money on tools. We're looking for a complete revolutionary approach that allows huge new business models to emerge from using tools. We don't have that in the life sciences. And when people say you need patents in the life sciences to innovate, I utterly refute that. Utterly refute that. The two most prominent technologies in the last 30 years in the life sciences are DNA sequencing, uh, DNA sequencing, the ability to determine the order of bases in DNA, was the most powerful technology developed in the last 35 years. It was developed largely by a man named Fred Sanger, an enormously creative inventor in Cambridge, England. It's not patented. And within moments of its development, it was broadly taken up. It has been the most pervasive technology. You don't need a patent to see broad adoption of a powerful tool. The other one, curiously also developed in Cambridge, monoclonal antibodies, hugely important, developed by Cesar Milstein and somebody Kohler. Kohler and Milstein. Bob Kohler, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, they didn't patent it. And it was taken up hugely in the medical industries in, in virtually everything. So people will tell you we have to have this to secure the investment. It's a circular argument, interestingly enough. To say we have to have the patents to secure the investment, Interestingly enough, they're saying we have to have the patents because other people might have the patents. It sounds like mutually assured destruction. So did we really need a nuclear silo? Well, Russia had a nuclear silo, so we had to have a nuclear silo. And it went back and forth and back and forth until one of them got bankrupted. Uh, that's not a sensible way to run a planet. Uh, and we don't have to. The neat thing is, since the free and open source software movement became so successful, we've actually, for the first time, been able to point at such a success as a metaphor. So we've been pushing this for 20 years in the life sciences. And people say, you know, they'd, they'd humor me a little bit, you know, and whatnot. But in the last three or four years, people say, geez, so the business models look like they are robust. And sure, there's a lot of differences, and we're not porting it over directly. There's a huge amount to be said for this. So when guys like Nick D'Onofrio from IBM come weighing out in a, in a panel that we're on that, that the, the analogies in the life sciences are too profound to miss, then other serious hitters take it seriously. So I think we're there. Plus, the system is collapsing. That's the other idea. We're just not getting much out of the pharmaceutical industries. We're not getting much out of agriculture. So the life sciences potential is augering in. 
So <laughs> that's the worst point. You ask me a short question, you'll get an answer that goes on and on and on. So uh, in partial answer to her question, one of the things that, that occurred to me when you were talking about being able to take a gene sequence and query it against what's out there, hmm. it would also be useful for, for people who to know who else is queried for the same kind of gene. Now, there are lots of issues. <laughs> sure. Are. But for instance, right, if somebody says, I've got this bug that's eating my plant, mm -hmm. right, it would be very helpful to other people to know who has the same problem. You're absolutely right. There's an initiative actually called GZ, which is a global initiative for sharing uh, um, avian influenza data. Maria's involved in this, and it's one that I believe she's talked to Vic Condotro about. Um, the whole issue is exactly as you say. To, to anticipate pandemics, you don't have to know which variant of the influenza is reported in a particular place, but people are jealously guarding that information, even though it's not to their advantage. So um, ironically, the reason that we're going to that, that, that there's potential for that is that people sense that if you have an open source premise, it's not just open. I mean, open source is not about just sharing it. It's about sharing with conditions of, of the reciprocity. If that is in place, then we can come up with incentives for people to share. But it's quite challenging, but hugely important, as you say. I mean, that one is a classic one. My God, I mean, the influenza, if that, if that takes off, all bets are off. So... Through the scholar feature, or which? The search of which? <coughs> I could. Oh, it's okay. General mission statement. Oh, okay. <laughs> the for biological information. Gotcha. Um, and so I asked the question, what if, what would that look like? You know, so obviously this is a, you know an, an area where you're very familiar with the whole mm. field, and like, well, what would improving the search for information mm -hmm. look like for you and your project? That's my question. Um, Are you a biologist originally, or? Or have you? Yeah, my background's in biology, and I used to do field biology. So ah. I did field surveys for bats, species surveys for bats in the neotropics. Oh, cool. Um, and, you know, ran into the same sort of thing, like, do I need to kill this bat? Well, <laughs> I'm pretty sure the information's out there that would enable me to answer that question. And without the answer to that question, without that information all being, you know, organized and accessible in some fashion, unfortunately, you know, usually ends up going badly for the bat. <laughs> Thank you.